Night at Nine on TV 12. Good evening, I'm Alistair Cook. We're at the second episode of our dramatization of one of the resounding Victorian scandals, Parnell and the English Woman. Charles Stuart Parnell, some upper crust English called him Parnell, but not his own people, was from a family of English Protestant landowners who'd settled in Ireland in the 17th century. And according to the custom of such families, he was sent to school in England on to Cambridge. But when he came back and saw an impoverished homeland, for the first time, he felt more of an Irishman than an Anglo-Irishman. He'd been a boy during the dreadful potato famine, which claimed one million dead. And again, the crops were failing, and again ferocious landlords were evicting thousands and thousands of tenant farmers who couldn't pay the rent. Parnell decided that landlordism was the curse of Ireland, and only one thing could banish it. Home rule. Ireland with its own parliament. So, in his 30th year, he was elected to parliament as an Irish member. There were about 50 of them then. Most broke away from the Liberal or the Conservative Party and formed a third party, the Home Rule Party. Parnell seized the leadership of it and made it the nucleus of an Irish national movement. And he accepted the support and the money of every kind of person, moderate, Catholic, Protestant, Americans, all the way over, unfortunately, to a terrorist group in Ireland which engaged in every sort of violence from looting to murder. It became so bad that the uh, Liberal Prime Minister, Mr. Gladstone, who was sympathetic to Home Rule, suspended habeas corpus and arrested Parnell as the symbolic head of the terror. Now, about a year before this, Parnell had met the wife of a retired soldier, an Irish member. She was Kitty O'Shea, and he fell in love with her. And she had made herself, shall we say, available by confiding that she had an arrangement with her husband. He lived in the town, she lived in the country. Parnell visited them, Parnell visited her. And sometime in 1880, the affair discreetly began. As my time approaches, Willie is solicitous for my health and comes to Elton more frequently than I would allow. My congratulations, sir. He thinks that the birth will seal our reconciliation, whereas I know it will only cement the cold hatred I feel towards him and consummate the love I bear my child's father. Other business. Uh, the um, O'Shea letter, Prime Minister. What? Mm -hmm. To this, sir. Uh, Mr. Chamberlain has received a communication from Captain O'Shea, the member for County Clare, who is not, so he protests, a nationalist. <laughs> The captain poses a question. How is the Liberal Party to get in at the next general election and the one after that without the Irish vote? Damned impudence. Agreed. It is, however, a question I have lately come to ask myself. This Captain O'Shea offers to act as intermediary between Mr. Parnell and ourselves. 
He believes we may yet find common ground. Excuse me, Prime Minister. <clears throat> you say the letter was addressed to Chamberlain. Why not to myself? I mean no offence, but I was not aware that Irish affairs were within the bailiwick of the Board of Trade. Uh, Captain O'Shea says that I appear to be a minister without political pedantry. <laughs> <laughs> what do we know of O'Shea, Mr. Forster? Uh, he's clever enough. No, cunning, I would say. Vain. Untrustworthy. What are his faults? <laughs> The captain says that 18 months ago, Mr. Parnell implored him to take over the leadership of the party. <laughs> that is a lie as childish as it is brazen. My understanding is that Parnell holds him in the utmost contempt. Indeed. O'Shea is an opportunist. He doesn't speak for Parnell, I'm sure of it. Nonetheless, it would be remiss of us to leave even the most unlikely of stones unturned. Mr. Chamberlain, will you pursue the matter? Not on our behalf, as an individual, you understand. If it becomes public, we repudiate. Sir, my name is Mr. Parnell. They have released you, then. We were not told. My dear sir. Delighted to see you. My sister's boy has died of typhoid in Paris. I have been put on parole to attend the funeral. Oh, I'm so sorry. You look unwell. It is not as bad as I feared. I thought that confinement would drive me mad. After six months, all I can complain of is the damp. Or rather, my sciatica complains of it. Whiskey? They locked the cell door at six every evening. That was the worst part. But I did not want for visitors. And there were letters. I take it you come from Albert Mansions. Pardon me. Well, since you tracked me down, you must stay the night, eh, okay. Fact is, we have Melancholy news of our own. I trust not. I believe I mentioned in one of my letters that Mrs. O'Shea and I had been blessed with the little girl. Yes. My felicitations. Not long for this world, I fear. What? True. Poor little thing. At first, she appeared to be thriving. And then, of a sudden, she seemed to go from us. Kate sent for me because... Because the doctor says she will not live through the night. Do you want to see her? Kate, no. Don't oblige, I guess. Yes. Yes, I would. Thankfully, we had her baptized. Catholic, of course. the government announce a satisfactory plan of dealing with arrears. Mr. Parnell will advise tenants to pay rent and will denounce outrages and all resistance to law, including the boycott. Other matters may be adjusted. The arrears are our sticking point. The original is not to leave your hands. I'll not give an inch. Joe Chamberlain knows he's not dealing with a milksop. 
I have to be direct with you, if my conditions are departed from in the minutest, then I will disavow both the agreement and yourself. You can trust me. With the help of this, you'll be winkled out of Kilmainham in no time. My release is secondary. I'll see to it. By the by, there is um, a personal matter. Personal? Between us. Perhaps I oughtn't to mention it. That little difference of opinion we had. What opinion was that? Well, I mean that nonsense of me sending you the challenge. Didn't stop to think. Felt a complete ass. So I hope that's all um, water under the, uh, the, uh, the bridge. I mean, you've entrusted me with this matter, fate of nations and so forth, and as far as this house is concerned, whether I'm here or in town, please feel free. It's over then, is it? Take it, sir, that a condition of his release will be that he makes a public declaration of penitence. Penitence? For his crimes. Were there any? My dear Forster, we would be poor men of business if we demanded that which we have no hope of receiving. If Mr. Farnell were to wear sackcloth in public, as you suggest, his people would call it betrayal. It would be the end of it. And the end of him would be the end of peace in Ireland. It's too bad. I win a promise that 100,000 Irish tenants will not be done for arrears of rent. I introduce land legislation. I get rid of the arch enemy Forster. And what is the result? There continues to be outrage, violence, and anarchy the length of Ireland. It has to be stamped out. You find that amusing. You remind me of a secretary for Ireland bringing in a coercion bill. David, don't think that I am on their side. Pray, do not make that mistake. I am in politics because of my hatred for them. But if home rule comes, and it will, it will not be won by shooting Englishmen from the cover of hedgerows. Ma'am, I admire your arrogance. David, be careful. You think you can play old Gladstone at his own crooked game and beat him? He'll have you for his bloody supper. What's more, you'll not see another red cent from America. You know their motto. You've heard it often enough. One dollar for bread and one dollar for lead. Aye, that's it. And once they've found out you've broken faith with them... Damn their impudence. And yours too, damn it! The Americans have never understood us and they never will. Even those who are as Irish as Paddy's pig. All they care to see is shamrocks and harps and... Their murder is clean and easy and 3,000 miles away. I've not broken faith with them because I did not preach, as you have done, the religion of death with the gallows for the high altar. We will have home rule. And we will have it my way. Mr. Pannell. Now you will go in. And I think I may say, on the part of all the speakers, that there has been very much a sound argument. no bitterness or acrimony introduced into the discussion, with, if I may be allowed to say so, one exception. My honorable friend, member for... Oh, 
Uh, Mr. Powell, I, uh, I congratulate you on the warmth of your reception. Your star seems to be at its zenith. Not quite yet, sir. I hope. You alarm me. Are you acquainted with Lord Frederick Cavendish? Mr. Forster's successor. How do you do? I'm sure that we shall have dealings. I shall tread carefully. The saying is that you are far too clever even to be secretary for Ireland. My real cleverness was in marrying Mr. Gladstone's niece. Nonsense. We expect great things. When do you go to Ireland? This very evening. And I wish you a pleasant journey. Good day. Well met. Did you go to the lodge? Shall we walk together? I'll be honest, sir. Thank heaven for fresh air. <laughs> Last night's jollifications were quite overwhelming. The Irish can rise to an occasion. <laughs> Don't often make it a new viceroy, nor for that matter a new secretary. I say, watch it, man! Surely done for us. Murder of Lord Frederick Cavendish and Mr. Perth. Oh no. Well, what will it mean for the party then? Once again, we are villains before the world. Hurry along, sir. Who will trust us now? Who will say that we are fit to govern ourselves? Seven months in prison and now this? Master was ours. We had him. The train is leaving now, sir. What will you do? I shall resign. No. What other course have I? It has to be done. I sent a message to Mr. Gladstone this morning. I entrusted it to Captain O'Shea. Who you can be sure of. I said that angel. rather than endanger the policies we have agreed upon, I was prepared to resign my seat. What? The Prime Minister declined my offer. He furthermore... The PM informed me that his duty did not permit him to entertain Mr. Parnell's proposal about that he was deeply sensible of the honourable motive by which it was prompted. Mr. Gladstone declined my offer. And most graciously, the G.O.M. Grand old man. You mean God's only mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and so in answer to Healy's proposal that the members resign en masse, that would leave me as the leader of a party of one. <laughs> no, Healy, I think not. And I have not been idle this afternoon any more than I was this morning. It is all arranged. And what is it that is arranged? I have applied for police protection for us both here and at Elton. You did what? 
Well, I thought it best to include myself, because the world knows it was I who engineered your release from Kilmainham. In the present climate, that will not be easily forgiven. Do you know what you have done? Do you? My dear sir, if I have done wrong I'm aware in ensuring... thanks to you, we are now tied in with the Dublin murders. Never. And you have I... left me open to the inference that since I seem to feel myself in need of protection, there exists on my part a consciousness of guilt. How do you mean? Furthermore, yes. by inviting the police to act as our nursery maids, you have given them their dearest wish the opportunity to spy on us in broad daylight. Come, sir, it's a black day for us. You're simply out of temper. You exaggerate. You damn fool! <clears throat> now that was uncalled for. Last time I do him a service. Uh, today, the only friend an Irishman has in this town is a jug of ale. I know a place. Who's with me? Devil take it! Fellow just insulted me! Peep a puddle, peep a pig! Now you made your mouth. Do you mean a public house? In this day of days, we'd be drawn and quartered. Not at all, sure. It has a snuggly. Well, I'm going to demand an apology. Where do you think he's gone? You'll never guess. Huh? Hey, if there's one kind of jackass that gets my dander up, it's the kind that thinks he's a bloody racehorse. Who are you, Joe? God almighty in his wisdom, why does the chief put up with him? Huh? You don't know. Do you? Ah, it's not Tim that's talking. It's John Barleycorn that speaks for him. And they right, Tim. There's an expression that the chief, as you call him, an expression that Mr. Parnell is very fond of. I have a government for Ireland in the palm of my hand, and so he has fair dues to him. Ireland is in the palm of Parnell's hand. And God help us. And us. There's another hand, and Parnell himself is in the middle of it. The fine hand of Willie O'Shea. That young fellow oughtn't to drink. Take it off him. O'Shea sits with the government. He votes with the Liberals and against us. Why does Mr. Parnell not treat him like the pariah that he is? Why does he employ him as his errand boy and go between? The man I wouldn't trust to, to pour that from a bottle. Easy now. It's a question, Joe. It is a question. Tim, there was a time when you lived in the chief's pocket. And he was father and mother to you, patron saint and God almighty. Well, whatever came between you and him, did he fall out with you? And not have doors slammed in my face. Is that all that ails you? I was there, I saw it. Well, now it takes little enough to turn you against a man. I never turned against him. He turned against me because I found him out. And I showed you. That little girl. From the girl in Holloway that had his bastard. You'll have one yourself someday. I he will. Should I have two? Grand we think. It was not from any girl in Holloway. My God, are the lassie blind. He's carrying on with a person who is... who must be as evil a woman as ever lived. Do you want me to tell you who she is? Go to Eltham. See for yourselves. women adore you as profoundly as does Eileen? Far more. Eileen is a moderate. Be patient. You knew she has a medallion with your likeness on it. She showed it to me. 
She was wearing it around her neck. I hope you told her not to. After a fashion. I said she should wear it under her bodice. Oh, you really are the most vain creature. <laughs> Do you think she knows about us? I think perhaps she chooses not to. As does your husband. Oh, that isn't true. Boise is no idea. Boise? I'm sure of it. Slipped out. It's a name I called him long ago. It suits him. And what was his name for you? How do you know he had one? I know it as surely as mine for you is Queenie. Come out with it. I tell you, I'll have it. Dick. What? He called me Dick. Dick. Ooh. <laughs> oh, God. And if Willie ever does find out about us? What then, divorce? Never. Not as long as Aunt Ben is alive and I'm her heir. And when she dies? Then I will make Willie rich and contented. That is, unless Mr. Chamberlain achieves that for him before I do. Chamberlain? How? Oh, don't you know? He and Willie are intimate. I think you mean as thick as thieves. Mr. Chamberlain says that after the coming election, when he's Prime Minister... Oh, the devil, he says! ...that he will appoint Willie as Chief Secretary for Ireland. And think of it, my darling. Then I'll be able to see your beloved Avondale. Willie O'Shea is Irish Secretary. Well, is it so impossible? Mr. Chamberlain... ...will never be Prime Minister, and your husband will never in ten lifetimes set foot in the Viceregal Lodge. So, Willie will never be the Irish Secretary? Not until the sky falls. My love, Chamberlain is a schemer who tells the fool what he most yearns to hear. Irish Secretary. After the next election, O'Shea will not even have a seat at Westminster. What? But he must. How? The Liberals won't adopt him. No one likes a renegade, not even the English. My people won't have him at any price. He has betrayed them. He votes with the enemy. He's an outcast. Well, the Irish will accept him if you tell them to. Not O'Shea. Not him. They never will. Whatever you say, they will do. You know that. You are their uncrowned king. Are you saying that for your sake, I should force your husband down the throats of honest men? You make a little thing sound so terrible. Charlie, you will do it. Why? Why is it so important? Already my people are asking what power he has that I allow him to meddle and interfere, that I suffer his impudence. Let them ask. Are you answerable to them? You say that you're not. You're never done saying that you're not. Hey. You cannot refuse me. Do it for... for us. For us? So that he will leave us in peace. Not two minutes ago, you were saying that we were in no danger from him as long as your aunt was alive. And nor are we. Now you say that we must pay twice for the same silence. I ask again. Why? So that he will be grateful. Him. Grateful to me. Grateful to anyone. My God. You care for him. No. Then why? Because. Because I care for my. Like any woman, I only exist in my husband's shadow, and now you tell me that soon he'll have no shadow to cast. I want a face that I can show to the world, even if that face is a false one. If he becomes a nobody, then even estranged from him, so must I be. Part of me is to have a life in the open. It has to be as more than the wife of a man who has neither position nor respect. If you want that for me, then you must help him. No. But then how can I not help you? Oh, no, 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 no.
father's arrived. Mm. Mm. Hello, Willie. Time to get ready for mass. Hello, my love. Hello, my been here this week? My friend? Not mine, sure. Oh, you mean Mr. Parnell? Yes, yes, he came on Wednesday for lunch. No, I meant in the evening. After all, I did tell the fellow who's welcome here at any time. Yes, that was rather impetuous of you. Luckily, Mr. Parnell has some sense of propriety. And then, he's not been here at night time. Most certainly not. You do believe me. If I have your word of honor. You do? And you accept it? Completely. And you accept that I accept it? Utterly. At luncheon, Mr. Parnell mentioned that he was going to Ireland. No, oh, but did he say why? His family estate has gone to the dogs and he hasn't been. So they've passed the hat around. Say? Hey? Every damn bog peasant and village idiot in Ireland. Instead of putting their money on the church collection place, they've given it to Parnell. Forty thousand. You mean people? Pounds. Goodness. Into that humbug's pocket. Cough. Price of patriotism. Two, what they say, the devil's children do have the devil's. I'm going mad. What's the matter, Willie? Where's our lily pond? That's a cricket pitch. Oh, yes. Mr. Parnell's devoted to cricket. supper and I must sing for it. After that, I'll see Avondale go on the auctioneer's block. I think you look upon it as charity. I will not call it by another name. You really are their king, you know. Although I, for one, wish to God you were not. Mind, for a monarch, you have a singular distinction. They love you not for anything useful you've accomplished, but because you've made their enemies hate you. Mr. Parnell, the Lord Mayor is just right. Time for the presentation. Mr. Parnell, how shall I call you as we mark this effulgent? Nay, this golden page in our cities. Nay, in our country's history. I'm crowned King of Ireland. I believe you have got a check for me. What? Indeed, yes. The man in Is whom I... Is it payable I... to order and crossed? And crossed. I perceive that it is. I am obliged to you. Now you must speak to them. Must. Must, do you say? They are our people. They expect us. the power to express adequately my feelings, not only with regard to the Parnell National Tribute, 
but to the magnificence of this demonstration. I prefer to leave with the historians the description of the occasion. As I propose to leave to posterity whatever fruits the occasion shall put forth. I bid you good night. about you. Have you no heart? It was heart, David. Heart and the singing of maudlin songs that kept us in the gutter for 700 years. Ask me to shed tears and you ask me to be no stronger than they are. Thank you, Eileen. I'll come down. I'm saying it isn't my place to say, ma'am. Well? The captain has a drop talk. It's the Irish roaring drunk. A new member for Liverpool has been celebrating. You can go to bed now, Eileen. Thank you, ma'am. This is a trifle late, Willie, even for you. Fifty-five votes. Oh, as narrow as that. Still, to win is the main thing. Well done, Willie. I was defeated. Are you deaf? The Conservative candidate won by fifty-five votes. I, I demanded a recount, no bloody use. A safe seat, I was assured. I, you were assured. Did you not have Lord Grosvenor's word for it? My God, five and fifty votes. I can't believe it. Well, you'd better. I'm done for. What's to become of us now? Our chicks. Really, if you mean the children, then say so. It's ruined. Ruined! Spare me your play acting. It's nothing of the kind. My dear, like a good many others in this election, you are no longer a member of Parliament. And now you and I must make the best of it. I think I begin to see. Do you? And what is it you see? That as well as those who have betrayed me, I have an unfeeling and unloving wife. You have been betrayed. I have been treated in blackguard fashion. Half a hundred pitiful votes. If he had given 
one more speech on my behalf. If he had just for a moment given thought to me rather than himself, then I would have carried the day. And who is he, Willie? I suppose you mean Mr. Parnell? Him! The ingrate, the architect of my downfall. Third. He went to Liverpool on your behalf. He withdrew his own candidate. He addressed meetings. He told the Irish voters you were the better man. You know he did. Then why was I not elected? Possibly, Willie, because the voters still invited. Then that could be ridiculous. The truth is that after all I have done for him, he has failed me most shamefully. Well, he has mistaken his man. I am not one to lie in a ditch. I mean to hit back a stunner. I have packed my shell with dynamite and it will send a blackguard's reputation as smithereens. What do you mean? I mean, his ruination is in these Sorry, sorry. Sit down. Now be good. Oh. And no more foolishness. Kate. He lost. And now he's threatening. I heard. We must get away from here, back to London. Are you insane? There's a storm outside. It'll be the end of you. No, no, no. Listen to me. Go to the kitchen. Wait there. Then come round to the front. Say that you've just heard the results and that your head can miss the race. Kate. Kate, where are you? I'm just talking to Eileen. Yes, my love. You must do mean things. So, from the beginning and it'll be so again. Go now. I was damn fond of that tree, you know. Oh, well. Yes, now I shall have time on my hands. Henceforward, I can be here all week. Politically, Liverpool need not be the end of you. No, oh, I'm sure there are any number of seats all going and begging. There is perhaps one. Ah. Luncheon. T.P. O'Connor has been elected to two seats. One of them, Galway. If I ask it of him, that is the one he will relinquish. Go away. But, um, you mean for me? But of course, and I'm bound to get in. Odds on favourite. Rank and file Irish voters think the world of me. Do they? I had not heard. Oh, yes, I'm popular with them. The scum in Liverpool, the renegade Irish, I had no chance. The scum in Liverpool turned against you, O'Shea, was that you continually spoke ill to them of me. Of you? Uh, insult you yourself with a denial. Kindly do not insult me! While I was on one platform after the next working to secure your election, you were proclaiming me a villain the length and breadth of Liverpool. I play your double game with the Galway voters and you will lose that seat as well. Do you understand me? Well, I'm flabbergasted. Captain I'm in my... O'Shea. I asked if you understood me. It's all right, Eileen, they're coming. I won't mince words, O'Shea. You are not wanted in Galway, or anywhere else. As it is, I'm going to have to ram you down the party's throat. Don't Most kind, I'm sure. For your own part, tread carefully and do as I say. Perhaps when you agree to take the pledge, they will accept it as a token of good faith. Pledge? What pledge is that? You know it as well as I do, and you know that it is mandatory that you will sit act and vote with the Irish Parliamentary Party. Vote with your lot? No fear. Joe Chamberlain will never speak to me again. Captain O'Shea, at personal cost, I do not know at what cost as yet. I am offering you the last chance you will ever have of regaining your seat at Westminster. The pledge is obligatory. I cannot work miracles. Refuse to take it and my people will reject you out of hand. I don't really believe that, do you? In any case, 
chap has his principles. Principles. Sorry. Can't be done. And stay here. Damn you. And repair your garden. Mrs. O'Shea, I find that I cannot, after all, stay to luncheon. You are kindness itself, but I had forgotten some business in town. I trust you will forgive me. Goodbye. No, my dear sir, the question we would ask is of a more delicate nature. And this is most distressing. The reason the Archbishop and I intrude on your valuable time is to do with a certain pernicious rumor. What to do with me? You will understand that since it has come to our ears, we are in duty bound to lay it to rest. The person who has been making this allegation is a colleague of yours, Mr. Vigar. Well, your Grace, that man is a known He claims that there exists an improper, I should say, a scandalous relationship between your wife and Mr. Parnell. He says what? Need one say that the more vile such rumors are, the harder they die. We are informed that this allegation is already the occasion for ribald gossip around the city. But how dare he? I'll sue him. That is a matter for your good self. However, if there were only an iota of truth in the charge, then the hierarchy would be compelled to direct their flock not to accept you as a candidate for Galway. To do otherwise would be to condone what is a grave sin and an offense to God. His Lordship and I are of a mind that you should be given the opportunity to deny the allegation or, unhappily, to confirm it. I see. What do you mean now? Your Lordship's on my knees, I swear to you. I swear there is nothing between my wife and Mr. Parnell. Nothing. The grass is wet, Captain O'Shea. Very well, then. You say that you will not have William O'Shea for Galway. You say away with him. Lynch! 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 Your man Lynch. is Lynch. Michael Lynch. Lynch. Still to promise you a government for Ireland? Am I? Mr. Healy? Mr. Bigard, tell me, either of you, what I may promise them? The man who strikes at this hand strikes at the hopes of the Irish nation. When has it ever been so necessary to uphold my authority as at this moment? When in this hand is the measure that will secure peace to this long neglected country. If I am defeated on this platform, if you set your faces against me, then the word will go out from here and through the universe that a disaster has overwhelmed Ireland. There will arise a shout from our country's enemies Parnell is beaten. Ireland no longer has a leader. Is that what you want? Let me a bit. The chairman pleases. For the sake of harmony and the good of the party, I ask to withdraw my no, candidacy no, 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 no. in favour of Captain O'Shea. Mr. Healy, do you continue to oppose the chair? 
I beg to withdraw my opposition to Captain O'Shea as candidate. I know it is a bitter cup for you. God will bear witness that it is a bitter cup for me as well. Even so, let it be drunk to the full for the unity of the party we love. Mr. Bigger. Mr. Chairman, sir. I do not agree with you. No, you will carry the day. But I'll say this to you. You have drawn upon the reserves of this party's loyalty and of our affection. Be warned, sir. If you attempt to draw on those funds again, you will find your account is empty. Aye, 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 aye. I had my stay. Mr. Lynch begs leave to retire in favor of Captain O'Shea. You did it. You won. Oh, thank you. Yes, he won. No one else did. You'll have gathered by now that uh, Parnell and Captain O'Shea had, apart from Kitty O'Shea, another thing in common, mutual hatred. O'Shea was a fairly contemptible type. He liked to play the side that paid off. But Parnell could not break with him in public. O'Shea had great influence with the Prime Minister Gladstone's only rival in the cabinet, Joseph Chamberlain, who could deny Gladstone lots of Irish votes. So that when people, including Parnell, suggested Parnell should resign on account of the Dublin Park murders, Gladstone said, absolutely not. How could we liberals ever win an election without the Irish votes? And also, don't forget, at any time, Captain O'Shea could publicize his wife's affair and bring Parnell down. Alistair Cook, Master Theatre. Good night.